But lately I've been migrating a lot of my applications over to my application server. Before I had applications a little bit in Kubernetes, a little bit on TrueNAS scale, uh, and a little bit on virtual machines. But for the most part, they were containers and they were running in Kubernetes at home, which works great for the most part until it doesn't anymore. So I decided like I need a little bit of stability and I wanna build this, this new box uh, and I wanna put my applications there. So I wanna co-locate co all of my applications for home use, of course, and you know, home lab stuff, put them all on one server. That one server is, you know, a Xeon server, lots of cores, lots of cache on the CPU, lots of PCI Express lanes, which means I could then have lots of disks and GPUs and anything else I want to throw in it. So I've been doing that the last, I'd say the last two weeks, and now my home prod is, is actually pretty stable. Lights work again from Home Assistant. I have a ton of AI stuff running that is like blowing my mind. Um, and uh, Plex is pretty, pretty stable. It was stable before, but I've noticed like a lot of the weird like hiccups and resume things that would happen don't happen anymore. So anyways, my, my applications are migrated there. I'm gonna have something for you very soon on, on some pretty, pretty private and practical uses for AI, like things you could actually use in your home. And uh, it's been so fun. It's been so fun figuring this out. A lot of work has gone into it too. I, I will say it's, it's kind of the wild west on setting this stuff up, uh, but I think I have something repeatable that I can share with you all that works with both GPUs and CPUs. So either, either way. Anyways, that's what I've been doing and migrating a ton of my applications. They're all over there. They're running great. Um, it is running in Docker Compose. I don't know. I, I'll probably detail it uh, somewhat in that video. I won't go too in depth in that video. I, I, I might break it up into, you know, what it is versus how to do it. I think that's that's a better way to do it. So the people who wonder what it is can figure out what it is without going through a tutorial. And then for the people who want to do it, can actually do a tutorial and follow along, uh, and vice versa. So, anyways, I, I'm super excited about that. Last night, I got the last little piece up and working. And my wife was like, wow. She actually said, wow, out loud when she saw this working. I, and I was too. The first time I saw it, I laughed out loud. It was like a, this nervous laughter because I didn't know how good it was going to be. So anyways, gotta, gotta, I have a lot of fun stuff coming. And then I'll hopefully explain the whole reason why I was building this application server. A lot of people were like, what the heck are you even tearing that HL15 apart? Like, why do you want a video card in there? Like... You know, you can play games on a smaller card and, uh, you know, this will hopefully make some more sense that now I'm building, you know, an application server uh, that can do AI that's all flash based with lots of RAM and lots of everything. So where CPU is almost a second class citizen now in this box to where, you know, as long as I have enough lanes and it's moderately fast, has a decent amount of cores, you know, it, it, it's not going to be doing a ton because my GPU is going to be doing a lot of these tasks. And also I... I, I'll, I'll shut up because I'm spoiling a ton of stuff, but I, I was actually surprised on how little power my NVIDIA 3090 uses when it's idle. Like, I thought, you know, there's this big monster video card. It's got to draw like, you know, 100 watts the whole time just being in there. No, it's like 5 watts. It's like 5 watts to be in there idle. So if it's not doing anything, it's using 5 watts, which blew my mind because I thought for sure, like, just adding a video card is going to add all this extra power and, and it's not the case at least for me it's roughly five watts uh just to have the thing in the, in there so pretty cool different story though different story when it starts doing <laughs> when it starts processing ai stuff i don't know so many so many cool things like nvidia cards are so cool right now because it's like wait i'll stop i'll stop because this is not I, i'll wait until the video comes out but i'm just like you know i i i i've always you know i i've been team green for a long time for nvidia because i i, I knew they had you know decent gpu performance so 3d rendering you name it for gamings uh and i always knew they had one of the best encoders you know nvank for encoding decoding uh h264 video or whatever the codec is and then on top of that i always knew that you know cuda cores were a thing and back when i did some little bit of ml and object detection i was like yeah this this is great it works now it's like now it's just like exponential how much how much you get when you get an Nvidia video card now because because now all of the AI, AI stuff I mean they 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 support Nvidia sometimes even before like CPU stuff so it's pretty cool. Anyways, I'll stop talking about it. That's coming in the future. Can't tell I'm super excited. If you're burnt out on people talking about AI, I am too. 
And hopefully this coming up will be for you because again, it's private, it's practical, and it's self-hosted AI stuff that you can do at home. So I, I'm super excited. I won't talk about it anymore, but that, that has been my last four days straight. I, pro I probably put, and I'll stop, I probably have at least, mm, I would say nine to 10 hours per day for the last four days getting this prepared. And that this is just me testing the system, getting it right, getting it repeatable, getting drivers installed, containers working, container toolkits, and then configuring Docker containers after that. So. And I haven't done any content creation for four days today. The last four days have been testing. So now, now I'm, as you can see, like this is what goes through my head before I start writing, you know, my content is, is, is all of these ideas and how do I, how do I communicate them out to you? Anyways, let's talk about what you're talking about rather than, uh, or you're working on rather than what I'm working on. Uh, I'd love to know what you're working on. Throw it in the chat. Let's talk about it. Again, if the lights don't work, I'll, I'll refund uh, points at the end. Let me test really quick because I did a a really quick change in a firewall rule right before we went live and it doesn't look like it's working. Although, although let, let me do one more thing. I, I never do this. I never do this live, but uh, I just want to make sure that uh, <laughs> it isn't DNS because, you know, if it's not a firewall, if it's not DNS, it's a firewall rule. Well, I fixed the firewall rule first. I do just want to make sure that I have a C name pointing to the right place. And if you can't tell, it's a, that's an airplane flying by our jet. Uh, because, like I said, I am uh, have the windows open. I actually live close to the airport too. So, anyways, it's 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 neither. So it's me. It's my code. Anyways, let's uh, let's let's hop into it. Let's see what you're working on. If you want to share something? Let's let's throw it in chat. Let's see what you're working on. I'd love to know. I'm gonna start from the top, work my way down, and we'll just talk. Uh, if you're new, we go roughly an hour. Try not to go too much over that because mods are here and plus you guys don't want to hear me blab for an hour. Uh, but if it goes a little bit over, I apologize. If it goes a little bit under, I apologize. It's just going to it's gonna be what it is. Oh, real quick, since I started doing this last time, uh, when I'm drinking, I'm a huge fan of, of sparkling water, bubbly water, seltzer water, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, 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 am, uh, I, 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 I don't choose any particular brand. I go after what tastes good. So um, this week, what tastes good for me is this raspberry bubbly? It's one of my favorites uh, as far as as far as tart fruit goes. <laughs> I've even categorized these, uh, but as far as tart fruit goes, I feel like this one's the best. Uh, nice floral, fruity flavor, and it doesn't have like a weird kind of like I don't know chemical aftertaste. It's just kind of you know a little bit of raspberry bite and pretty smooth at the end. A lot of carbonation, super good. If you're looking for something that's tart and fruit, this is the one to go for. The bubbly version of raspberry. Yeah, super good, super smooth. So, all right, let's 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 uh, let's hop into it. Let's see what you guys are working on. I'm gonna, just going to like start clicking on all kinds of stuff. And uh, I do apologize if the lights aren't working. I will try to call stuff out as they happen. And I didn't get into events. So let's get into events really quick. And that is a great reminder. Thanks, Yocto. So Yocto, Risa, Prime, dude, let's go. 19 months, thank you so much. Yocto, running YWS. He says, got a 400-day service, 400-amp service to the garage installed. Uh, now working on planning the rest of the remodel, planning the raised tile flooring next. Wow. So if you don't know Yocto, he, uh, he runs YWS. I joke around. I call it YWS, uh, for Yocto web services, but he runs, uh, basically a hosting company for friends and people outside of his garage, which he is now turning into like a full fledged data center. He's got a 400 amp service running to his garage now, and he's going to lift the whole floor up, I guess, to put tile underneath which is awesome uh because then uh, you don't have to worry about flooding and some people run cords under there or some people run cords on top i don't know what people do anymore i think the trend lately is on top but back when i used to do it everybody put it on the floors uh but wow that is awesome can't wait to see pictures i also have no idea what it takes to raise your whole entire floor uh i'm interested <laughs> in seeing that process i remember a data center we worked at yeah the floor was raised had a bunch of holes in it AC would come through, I think, uh, and they're all tiles and you could pull them up and look under and kind of see a ton of cables that you never wanted to, to deal with. And, and that's all I know about it. <laughs> a few times I've had to do a cut and pull way back in the day. They, they were cutting out Cat 5 and I think putting Cat 6 in it. And it was they called it a cut and pull and it's literally cut and pull. Cut that thing, pull it as hard as you can and try to get it through there. So anyways, dude, thank you so much. Oh, dope. Vite it. Uh, resub. Uh, tier 1. 
two months. Thank you so much for the sub. Time to support with the subscription. Appreciate it so much. I want to pronounce your name right. I'm going to say Vaidit. Vite, Vite, Vite. You can tell me how phonetically in chat. Otherwise, I'm going to pronounce it horribly until until uh, you correct me. But thanks you so much for the sub. Appreciate it. Continued support. Two months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then there were a couple more events. Uh, so Pixie, thanks for the follow. Deadly. Uh, it's just Jay, uh, the the Doctor Evil. Uh, let's kept. Let's kept. Lest <laughs> the less kept secret. I like it. Uh, and then. CIA Nide, uh, John Paul, Jean Paul, uh, Beloik, and uh, Pyromra. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Welcome. Okay, now let's let's get in the chat. Thanks for the support. I really appreciate it. Sometimes I forget to say it at the end, but thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, let's see what's going on. Modest Tim, happy Saturday. How's it going? Modest Tim, did I? Okay, I think there was an event in the beginning by Modest Tim. I can't remember as I was testing stuff. If there was, I do apologize. Oh, yeah, Modest Tim. I don't know why your uh, your sub doesn't appear here. Oh, Modest Tim, resub, tier one, 23 months. Let's go. I see it now. Thank you so much. Happy Saturday to you two. Almost one year. Let's go. Simon Ott, thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Uh, Modest Tim, how's it going? Um, I am Upa. I hope you're doing great again. I wanted I wanted to apologize in advance for throwing uh, long questions at you. Hey, that's okay. That's okay. You, you did last time, and it turned out pretty good. First question. Woo! Yeah, you weren't you weren't uh, you weren't joking. It can't even fit on the screen. I'll try to get caught up. Uh, I'm currently running my GitLab instance and GitLab runner on Docker and have successfully tested my configuration to ensure CI/CD workflows. However, I'm unsure which Docker image would be best for CI/CD. Should I use the Python Alpine or stick to the default Ruby image? Also, uh, should I keep GitLab instance and GitLab runner on separate server VMs or same server VMs? A lot of questions in there. A lot of questions in there. I see some suggestions too by Pizza Geek to use Canico. That that is a great option to do. Uh, and uh, but let me let me uh, so let me break this down. First of all, uh, the base image doesn't really matter. I use their default of Ruby. Do I even use Ruby? No. Most of the time, if you're using the base image, the only thing you care about is bash because you're going to do some shell scripting, right? Or you're going to assign some variables globally or update global variables. Base image doesn't matter. I would probably use whatever they use. I just wouldn't change it, right? Right? Because at the end of the day, you're most likely just using that base image just for shell scripts. So doesn't matter. I would use theirs. I wouldn't probably bring in Python because who knows why? I mean, you wouldn't even need Python. That Ruby one is super small. So... There's that. Uh, next, you're saying, uh, unsure which Docker image you use. We talked about that. Um, Alpine, yep, talked about that. Uh, GitLab instance. Oh, so should you keep your runners and your source control on separate servers or separate VMs? Um, this, th it depends. It depends, right? Um, if you only have one box and it's a pretty decently sized box and you're not running a ton of jobs, CI jobs, I say one is fine right? One is fine. When is one not fine? Well, when you're running lots of jobs, when you have a system that can't handle uh, that much IOPS or that much compute, uh, which can happen when you run CI. So CI is, 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 is a noisy neighbor, right? What's a noisy neighbor in tech? Well, it's, it's when you're in a shared instance, someone else who's in that shared instance with you is running uncontrolled or unconstrained either on IOPS, CPU, or RAM, right? And so runners are definitely noisy neighbors because what's the first thing they do? The first thing they do, at least in GitLab CI, is they're going to pull down an image, right? They're going to pull down a Docker image or a container image. And that could be small in the case of Alpine, or it could be gigantic in the case of whatever else you want to name, Debian plus, I don't know, whatever, whatever whatever the case may be, no JS, full no JS 20, right? Where it's all of Debian, all of no JS and all their tools, right? So it's going to pull down four or five, 600, you know, meg image, uh, which could, you know, impact the IOPS of not only that machine, but everyone else on there. So it's kind of up to you. Um, you know, in my, in my production, I'll say this, uh, even for work, we have separated, we have separated where the runners run. Right in a real production scenario, I think you would want to. Right uh, in a in a in a work scenario, you know, you might have Kubernetes nodes for your production workloads, and then you would have production or, or nodes dedicated to CI 
that were different nodes, a different node group, so that those CI jobs never really impacted your production workloads. At home, it, it's totally up to you. But if you're gonna be running something like Kubernetes and K3S on, on that same box, you might you might see some at CD timeouts or you know a lot of things happening and shuffling, which could cause cascading. I don't want to say failures, but probably cascading failures to where they all are just uh, in you know all in a bunch and just not sure what to do until you know they they all recover. Long story short, shouldn't be a big deal uh, if you can separate them. I personally do separate it. I separate it uh, because because of noisy neighbors. And so like going back to like another reason why I'm building my app server it kind of falls into place. Right now my CI runs in my production Kubernetes in my Colo, right? And so it is like the noisiest neighbor of all, like, right? It's gonna pull down those images. It might compile some stuff depending on what I'm doing. It's gonna build images, which is another resource intensive task. And then it's gonna push those images to a registry. So every time that happens, I see the latency you know, rise on all of my services. And I'm like, eh, probably shouldn't be building there. Like it's isolated, but I probably shouldn't be building there. It's a super noisy neighbor. So I'm gonna pull my builds back to my application server where it's like, you know, who cares? I mean, it's home. Yeah, so anyways, yeah, good question. I I, I like this uh, because I, I've, I've had to think through it a lot, uh, both home, work, and, you know, prod, work my personal work prod, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, but PC Geek says, yeah, use Canico. Cano goes uh, uh, a great a great drop in replacement uh, for Docker in Docker if you want to build Docker images in Kubernetes. It's, it's kind of wild. Uh, but if you think, hey, you know, if you're in a Docker container and you need to build a Docker image, you need Docker, right? Well, if you're in Kubernetes, you don't have Docker and you can't run Docker inside of a in container D, right? And so what Canico does, what, what Google built, was a drop-in replacement, for the most part, a builder uh, for Docker images that you can use within Kubernetes. <laughs> you could also use it within Docker 2. There's Builda 2, which is B-U-I-L-D-A. I think it has more options, uh, but I, I've been a huge fan of Canico. I've been using it for a long time. The one thing that Canico doesn't support is multi-arch builds. And so I don't know if they've added that feature. You most likely don't need to build multi-architecture, right? You don't need to build something for ARM 7, ARM 8, x86, x64. For most cases, it's your own stuff. And even if it is your own stuff, most likely it's only x86 anyway. So, but that is one thing to keep in mind if you do use Canico. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, all, all great stuff. I, I love CI stuff for sure. For sure. Um, let's see. Um, PC Geek, what are you working on? My new diet, LOL. Hey, uh, I'm low sodium. Uh, well, at least monitoring my sodium intake now. Hey, hey, yeah, that's good. Uh, I went to the doctor with swollen legs, feet, and they said I have too much sodium in my diet. So I was retaining water. Oh, wow. Uh, since Tuesday, I went, uh, since Tuesday when I went, I lost six pounds. Whoa, that, that is a lot of water, man. Yeah, I uh, I see how it's easy to do. Yeah, absolutely. Sodium is going to help you retain water. Uh, some people need sodium, right? Because they can't retain water. Seems like you're getting too much. I'm not a doctor. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. One thing, uh, one thing uh, I will say, I'm not a doctor, but if you drink diet soda, diet soda has some sodium in it too. So you might have to cut some of that out too. I don't know if you're a diet soda drinker or full on soda drinker, but uh, the whole like sugar, fat, salt, like it's like this triangle. And usually you can pick two or you can pick one. I don't know what it is, but they usually slide in one of those. Like if it has no calories, they're usually adding sodium. So, uh, but check, check to make sure. Uh, dub, dub D. Uh, migrating media servers to a new NAS uh, build on Johnsbo N4. Awesome. Sweet case. I'm downsizing currently and getting rid of my rack. Hey, yeah, yeah I hear you. I hear you. A lot of, lot of downsizing going on, a lot of shifting going on, a lot of things going on. You know, when, with, with energy high, the cost to cool is super high, uh, which plays into energy. Uh, and just with things getting smaller, uh, being more efficient. And not necessarily efficiency for the sake of, you know, lower energy, which is good too. Uh, but things are getting more efficient and smaller at the same time, you know. You know, like N100 can do <laughs> probably 99% of what we want to do out of a server until you start getting into, you know, more advanced use cases. 
Uh, but for NAS especially, you know, a, a lightweight Intel uh, CPU can do a majority of what you want to do, right? It can do, what can it do? Wow, yeah, it can do compute, right? It can do, uh, um, it can do uh, encoding and decoding via QuickSync. And then hopefully in the future, some more GPU based tasks. So neural network type stuff. And that's where, that's where I think Intel has a huge opportunity right now. If they launch, yeah, I won't go into this, but as I was thinking like all of this through and building my AI stuff, you know, if Intel launches a, a, a CPU with more, you know, even, even I, I want to say, I don't know, I would love it if it was consumer, you know, like, a, you know, uh, the 15th gen or something, they won't do it. But if they let, release a CPU that had more lanes, it already has great performance on single and multi-thread, right? And has E-Core, so cores are fine, CPU is fine. Uh, QuickSync is awesome for encode and decode tasks, right? Uh, especially with AV1, 2, decode, encode. If they would just add a better <laughs> NPU or you know something to, to handle uh, AI or ML type tasks better than they have today, I think the Intel can 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 you know I don't know win over a lot of people without having to jump over to Nvidia. Anyways, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about <laughs> migrating a NAS. Uh, awesome. I, I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, it happens. It happens to me. I, I've done this so many times in my life. Right. I upscale. I downscale. I consolidate. I whatever the opposite of consolidate is, expand, right? Uh, I, I specialize, I generalize. Actually, it was the other way around. I generalize, I specialize, right? And so I've done it so many times um, that I, I've lost count, but I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad you're thinking about it and saying like, hey, like maybe I don't need all this stuff. Maybe a couple of new things that are more efficient will, will serve me better. So yeah, awesome. I, I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm on board for both. Uh, Kaiser Sose. Uh, so I swapped switches at home and now my TrueNAS core won't connect via iSCSI to my ESXi cluster or vice versa, trying to track down the issue, but so far, no luck. Any suggestions? Okay, so you swapped out a switch at home and now your TrueNAS core won't connect via iSCSI. If it's only iSCSI, that, yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Like if you have IP, you know, and you have IP and it is connecting to the right IP, that's kind of weird that just iSCSI alone wouldn't work. I got nothing. I got nothing because 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 my my troubleshooting is going to be basic like, hey, ping it, hey, query the port, you know, do those types of things. But if it's only iSCSI, that, that is it's kind of weird. Sounds like, did you, maybe your MTU size? I don't know. Did you adjust MTU size anywhere on that switch or anything like that? Uh, I, I would assume that would be switch level. Um, maybe depends if you have what sir what you're using. But if all else is extinguished, maybe you adjusted your MTU or the MTU is not what you think it is. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, that would affect everything on the switch though. So I, I'm I'm totally totally just uh, uh, spitballing. So I wish uh, I wish I, I wish I had a better suggestion. Uh, missing the iSCSI VLAN. I like it. I like that too. That too. Yeah, I like it. Your data network, your data VLAN is something I, I didn't think about. Didn't think about. Good, good call. RGB adding megahertz, like not stickers adding HP. It does. It does add megahertz. Does. Uh, I think red adds megahertz. Uh, blue adds cooling. Uh, and then you can mix and match and pink will do a little bit of both. Green is for efficiency. Uh, and yellow is for lulls. I don't know what yellow is for. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it works. It works. Trust me. Uh, CB, CBP Copilot. Uh, trying to figure out how to get TrueNAS uh, email alerts to work with an Office 365 account. Cannot, for the life of me, get it to send an email. Interesting. So, so I, I mean, I, I, I've done TrueNAS alerts with SMTP. You're probably not going to do that. Although you could, I think. Um, where you authorize that account, but then maybe <laughs> yellow's for profit. I like it. Yeah. If you're mining Bitcoin, yellow is for profit. I like it. There you go. Um, so, um, yeah, I, you're probably not going to want to use SMTP cause you probably have multi-factor authentication on it. And the whole reason why you don't want to do that is cause you can't, because you can't authenticate through multi-factor. So usually I think you set up an app password, right? I don't know if this is the same on Office 365, but on my Microsoft account, I can set up, you know, an app password uh, to use for that account. Um, and then I can set up SMTP 
uh, that way, where I use my email address and my app password that I've authorized uh, in my Microsoft account place. <laughs> I don't know what that means on Office 365 if you're if you're using like a, a work workspace or anything like that. But that's typically where I do it. It's like Microsoft security account at passwords generate and then you generate one. And then you supply that for your password and keep that very safe. Keep that super safe cuz now that is a password that will bypass multi-factor authentication. Like keep that safe. Like that is like the password you do not want to lose because anyone will be able to get into your account using just that without multi-factor. And so, yeah, that's, it, it, it's basically circumventing multi-factor uh, because machines can't do multi-factor. So uh, give that a shot. Uh, you probably looked at it. I mean, you know, the, I, I, I'm just calling out some of the obvious, uh, but just in case you didn't think about that, yeah, you might need an app password. You probably thought about it though. Oopa. Uh, I found traffic to be a bit complex to configure, especially since I don't do a lot of self-hosting. Instead, I'm using a combination of Nginx Proxy Manager and Cloudflare Tunnels to host a few apps. Do you think this is a, a secure approach given that I'm relying primarily on Cloudflare? Yes, I do. I do. I do. Like, uh, yeah, I do. So, 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 so two pieces there. Hey, traffic's complex. I get it, right? Traffic was really made uh, to, 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 to be cloud native, right? All, all CLI, all YAML, like whatever, no UI for it. Right. I totally get it. And Nginx proxy manager solves that by saying like, Hey, we're going to use Nginx. We're going to turn into a proxy. We're going to give you a great UI to do all these things. Totally fine. Totally fine. Like I have no qualms with that. And I, I highly recommend going that way. If you aren't familiar with YAML, don't want to deal with YAML, don't want to deal with like you know, even figuring out like containers and all that. Although Nginx Proxy Manager, you can run a container, you get a great UI to configure all that. So yeah, totally fine. That's great, great solution. And then using Cloudflare Tunnels, sure. I mean, I haven't heard anything bad about Cloudflare Tunnels yet. Um, you are getting, you know, the same, you're you're getting protection from Cloudflare for one, right? You're, you're, you're leaning into this whole big security architecture that they have around you know, people coming into their proxy, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what you're doing. You're going in through Cloudflare's proxy and then down to your system, right? And so, you know, it, it, if someone's going to try to attack you, you know, that's really them also trying to attack Cloudflare too, right? So it's like, you know, attack on you is like an attack on them, right? And so, so they, they're, they're incentivized, you know, to, 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 to keep, their infrastructure is secure. And plus like, like that's their business, right? That is their business. They have a lot of businesses, CDN, all this stuff, uh, but their reverse proxy, their web application firewall, like all of their security around their load balancers and, and, and uh, proxies, either in, ingress or egress, like that, that's what they make their money on. So I, I think it's a, I think it is a secure solution. Um, you can restrict it even a little bit more. I would highly recommend it if you're going that route, um, if you don't want something to be totally public, to also add in the zero trust product, which you know is basically uh, putting an auth proxy around your endpoints so that people need to authenticate to get to it. And so if you have things that you want to expose publicly, but you don't really want to expose them publicly, use, you know, combine it also with their zero trust uh, product, which will then, you know, uh, it'll, it'll, uh, you can authorize people by email that can get to it. And uh, they'll have to supply a multi-factor auth, right? They'll they'll get to it. They'll be sent it. They'll be sent a code to their email, and then they'll have to go to their email to actually retrieve it and put it in to get to there. So, so I would do that. And if it's totally public, public, then I mean, you, I mean, then it's then it's all on you, because then it's like, okay, now now you're relying on your security infrastructure. Like once they get through, right? And so that has nothing to do with Cloudflare. It's it's all you after that. But I mean. Yeah, it should be should be pretty fine. <laughs> Just depends. Um, is it compatible? Oh, usually reboot servers. Is it compatible with Linux, Linux commands? Kaiser so say, oh, this is about the reboot. All right, let's see. Um, setting up Wuzza right now. Dr. Evil, all right. This is one thing I, I've been wanting to test for a while. Wuzza. So so I think like a security, um, security solution, right? Uh, I'm sure there's a better name for it, but uh, I, I think like... Uh, I don't know a better name for it. 
uh, basically SecOps for your whole entire environment where you can install agents and see where things are going, what they're doing, and have a centralized console uh, that will analyze those connections as well as give you ways to possibly remediate it. You know, just basically giving you visibility around like all of your all of your endpoints, which is which is pretty cool. Sounds cool. I, I want to get to it. I want to get to it. It's it's definitely on my short list. It keeps bubbling up. I just need some more time. Slinky, slinky, <laughs> slinky biased, based. I'm going with that. Uh, playing around with Plex webhook functionality. Cool. Uh, looking to add a currently listening component to my personal website. I like it. I like it. So, so okay. So, so, so you have Plex running. Uh, Plex has an API, and then Plex also has a has webhook fu functionality. Uh, to where I think, I think uh, it might be two ways. It could be wrong. To where you can either post to that webhook for things to happen. I guess that's an endpoint, or, or. It can do things for you when things happen. So based on an event, basically it could post to your endpoint and tell you what you're currently listening to is what you want to do, which is so pretty cool. So so if, I, if I'm designing this in my head, the software developer me and it's like, okay, so Plex is going to post some JSON, some body to my web server. It needs to know the URL. I'll probably authenticate. I'll probably verify and I'll probably limit to only select IPs. Uh, I'll do all the checking there. If that all passes, uh, then I'll probably put it in a database somewhere or even just in memory uh, to where my front end can then call in and get that, uh, get that, 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 that same body or maybe uh, massaged a little bit into a format that it can then use to display this on your website. Yeah, I like it. I like where you're going. I, so I have to like think things out uh, like that. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've written a lot of web websites and, and services and it's super fun to do. Especially when it's like, you know, something as personal as like, hey, what you're listening to and getting it on your website, two things that uh, are probably all in your control uh, since Plex has webhook functionality. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. Uh, Canical stuff plays nicely. Yeah, Canical for stuff for sure. Uh, I'm primarily focused on uh, deploying my web application. So I was considering using a node image. However, I'm unsure. Uh, will it be too resource intensive? So this... um. I, I see where you're going. I see where you're going. Just a, um, just general guidance, right? <laughs> this is like guidance I would give, I guess, someone on my team who wasn't familiar uh, with with uh, CI pipelines that were based on container images. Use the base image until you can't anymore. That's kind of what I say. You know, use the base image until you can't anymore. If you need to massage stuff, if you need to create folders, if you need to create variables, you know, as you're building that container, use that. Um, then if you need specific things from a container, let's say you need node, right? Let's say you need node because you need to do, uh, you need to tran, uh, uh, not transcribe. <laughs> uh, let's, I don't, I don't know. You need to convert JavaScript to, to TypeScript, right? And so you need to bring in node to be able to do that, to install your node dependencies to then, you know, translate, transcribe that into into uh, 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 JavaScript, right? And so you only need that container for that one spot in the CI, so you switch to it, and then, then the next step, you just switch back, right? Unless you're gonna run Node full-time as, as, as your web server, depends on how you wanna run it. If you're running client-side stuff, you don't need it. You could use Nginx at the end, but if you're running server-side, then you, then you probably do. Um, but then there's some tricks you can do, right? Like if you use the last step to, to, to build the thing, you don't need to use the same container to actually host the thing, right? And so while you did build it with a full fat Node.js container, when you actually host it, you could pull in a lighter Node.js container, like one based off of Alpine. So there's a lot of tricks you can do if you're building your own containers. You could switch, you could cache layers, uh, and there's a lot of examples. So if, if you're building a container, um, in CI, just look for multi, it's, it's like multi-step builds or something like that. And that'll get you down the right path where you're only using a container for each step that you need. And at the, at the very end, you're using the lightest, smallest container you possibly need to host the thing and to store the thing. So yeah, it's, uh, it's fun stuff. I've done a ton of optimizations in every CI pipeline I've ever written. So it's, it's super fun stuff. Uh, Blink, 
Oh, no. BP. Oh, I got to get this right. Uh, BP <laughs> Clink. I'm going to go with BP Clink. Clink 66. All right. Uh, greetings and salutations. I've been able to remove some of my Band-Aid fixes, but still have <laughs> bailing wire holding everything together. I've implemented Kia DHCP and Bind 9 DNS services. Both are overkill for the size of my home network. Now I can build up from there, including implementing my own OPN Sense firewall. It's ready to go, but waiting for downtime so I don't interrupt the network service for my family. That is awesome! Wow, you are, you are really going out so out there. So you 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 you're putting in your own DHCP service. You're like, yeah, firewall. I don't I don't care about what my firewall has or anything. I'm gonna I'm gonna run my own DHCP service. You know, of course, based on something else. Same with D is same with DNS. You're just like, yeah, don't want your router stuff. I'm gonna do that. Uh, and then yeah, then building up uh, and then. Built up from there, including the implementation of OPN Sense Firewall, and then the, and then using the firewall. And so you're not using DHCP and DNS there. You're going to use it uh, elsewhere. So pretty cool. I totally get it on the downtime for family. I mean, me personally, I only have one other person to worry about to take stuff down. So my windows are usually pretty big, especially like today. Uh, and sometimes in the evening, I have pretty large windows where I can take the internet down. Uh, but if you have a family, it's like every every person in the family needs to not be using the internet, which is never unless they're out of town or like sleeping. <laughs> well, good luck with that. I, I hope you figure it out. I hope you found a, a good downtime window. And and if you don't, I mean, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people have unlimited data on their phones and maybe maybe they could tether or something like that. That is awesome. Sounds fun for sure. Uh, weird. I go through this. Oh, this is still about that. Uh, uh, K, K D L O C. I'm just going Panda. K, K lock, K D L O C. I'm going Panda. Panda, uh, build an open source data lake. Wow. Okay. So open source data lake on K3S, Spark, Iceberg, Dremio, uh, Jupiter Hub, Nessie, and Minio for object, Proxmox, Intel, NUC. Same build as Techno, so same build as me. So uh, Intel NUC, 11th gen probably, right? Max out the RAM, throw an NVMe drive in there. Pretty awesome. So wow, I've never thought about building a data lake. I mean, I'm not, I, I've never done a ton of data stuff. I mean, I've done, you know, database stuff plenty of times, uh, but never like data at aggregate. That wasn't in the cloud, I guess I should say, because I've, I've used a lot of, I don't know, big query, big table, like GCP type stuff. Um, I get, yeah, I, I, I've done some elastic at home. Okay. But I mean, just, just, uh, it means to an ends, right? I was never like analyzing data. I was really, you know, collecting metrics or uh, making search endpoints. And so, you know, it's kind of easy to do, but this sounds pretty awesome in K3S on top of all that. So, wow, that sounds pretty awesome. I'm curious, like, what are you storing in there? And, and then, yeah, mini O for object storage. I use it too, or min IO. I love it. Um, yeah, pretty cool. What, what are you going to store in there? What are you going to store in there? Because <laughs> uh, because in order to have a, well, you can have a data lake that's empty, but I'm wondering what you're going to fill that lake with. You know, data lake generally, you you know, you have rivers, you know, that uh, all these data sources, you know, flow into this big lake and then you could do stuff in aggregate, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, curious, curious to know. Elastic at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elastic at home. I totally agree. I totally agree. Same here. Same here. Uh, real quick, getting caught up on follows. Uh, Coach, Coach Ripkins, uh, Scott, Scott Tumstead, <laughs> Totemisty, and Simonot. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Welcome. Um, let's see. Uh, Phantom Way, what audio uh, mixer are you using with the pod mic? Phantom Way, hey, uh, this is it. it, it <laughs> I won't go into it. I've had some problems. Uh, last one died. Uh, this one's working a little bit better. I'm using with a Mac, which is just not a great combination um, in general. Anyways, all of that aside, uh, pod mic plus Wave XLR. And the Wave XLR by itself and on Windows, I think is pretty great. I think it's pretty great. Um, Mac, it, it's not pretty great. <laughs> it's not great. That's what I'm I'm using right now. Um, and it's not pretty great because, because Mac does some really weird stuff with like USB-C I don't know. Mac just does a lot of like USB like limiting. So any, and, and, and let me explain. So like anytime your CPU seems to do things on a Mac, it seems like sometimes it starts dropping out hardware. 
CPU gets too busy, Bluetooth stuff stops working. CPU gets really busy, USB stuff stops working. And that's happened to me on like two MacBooks and now a Mac Studio. So I think it's something deep within the OS. Anyways, that aside, that happens to me quite a bit on here uh, because this doesn't have any onboard processing. So all the processing is done on your machine, which on a Windows machine, on any modern Windows machine, totally. It's not even a hiccup. Like you don't even notice, you know, it's a rounding error. Uh, but for some reason on Apple Silicon, as strong and powerful it is, it just, it freaks out and the audio will cut out. Like any moment right now, this thing will disconnect and reconnect as if I plowed the plug and plugged it back in. And then the default uh, setting is to mute for me. So it's it's super weird and super annoying. Anyways, all that aside, I 100% believe it's it's my Mac now, nothing to do with uh, Wave XLR. It's a great product uh, uh, by Elgato. They make tons of great stuff. I have this room has Elgato stuff in there. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I don't have any settings. I think I have a light like compressor on it and that's it. Just so I'm not yelling uh, as loud as I just see that I am, I'm peaking a little bit, so. Anyways, I, I like it, I like it. I, I do love like Windows, I do love Go XLR. So now that we're on the topic, I love my Go XLR. I still have it. I saw that they released a firmware update for Go XLR. Everyone thought they were going away and discontinued. And they're like, nah, that's not happening. So they released a firmware update and they said Go XLR 2 is coming. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, I think soon I will be going back to my Windows for streaming. Uh, I'm only on my Mac now because I'm waiting for Intel to release something for me to actually want to buy. I hope 15 gen Intel is that uh, because 13 and 14 is not that, not that there's anything wrong with it, but if I've waited this long, I, I have an eighth gen Intel in there now. It's also running Linux now. If I've waited this long, I'm waiting for like an architecture redesign of the Intel processor. And I hear that's happening in 15. Now, now don't get me wrong. A jump to a 12th or 13th or 14th gen would be fantastic. Like it would knock my socks off, right? Uh, but if I waited this long, I'm 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 kind of I'm kind of waiting for for new features or new new you know whatever the new architecture is that's coming. I shouldn't say like architecture, maybe that's a it's a bad choice of words. Uh, but they are redesigning a lot of the chip. I heard in 15th gen, which we should have this fall, and I'm hoping with that comes I don't know features I might use. <laughs> who knows probably features i won't use uh but i feel like if i waited this long i'm gonna wait a little bit longer all that being said uh wave xlr it, it's great it's great uh no qualms but if i had to put it up against my go xlr go xlr is a lot more complicated but it it does have a chip to do processing on board on device which which i didn't know was great until i left it so anyways iot uh, iot IOT and me labs. I, I, I have a hard time saying that. Dude, thank you so much for the prime sub. 25 months, you one year, one month. Thank you so much. Setting up moonlight, sunshine, and Linux Mint to stream games everywhere. Yeah. So I so I I am familiar with Moonlight, right? Moonlight is the open source way to stream games, I think, from an NVIDIA video card to anywhere. Um, I've used Moonlight on my Apple TV to stream games from the my nvidia video card which was super cool like i was like whoa how is this this low latency it worked really well like just as good as like you know steam uh streaming sunshine i'm not as familiar with i i assume it's something i assume it's something really similar and then linux mint that is awesome that is awesome huge fan of i think that's ubuntu based uh it's been a while since i looked at mint it might be might be time to to look at it again but i think and then i i used ubuntu mate for a while and i think ubuntu mate is 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 uh based on mint too so yeah it's pretty cool uh i i enjoy those days flip-flopping but I, I liked mate it was really because why did i like mate is because at the time mate was one of the few uis that had like baked in dark mode like like the whole thing was flat and dark and i love that i love the flat and dark look so anyways yeah it sounds fun i i, I have a regular ubuntu running on this now uh, maybe i should go mint maybe i should try it i should try it soon pretty soon though i i, I want to redo my rack to where i have windows mac linux all in this mini rack right here and i can flip flop to any of them do almost anything on any of them but at the same time record video uh from any of those input sources to whatever my recording device is 
Soon, soon. It's coming soon. And, and I'm going to be changing audio here soon, too. So anyways, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, I, I have a lot of changes coming, uh, but those changes, uh, they add up quick. Whenever you do audio or video stuff, it adds up quick. It adds up quick. So uh, let's see. Munzee ordered myself a 3D printer. Bamboo has a sale going on. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Yeah, I, I, everyone tells me, yeah, it's uh, the, the, the best time to buy a 3D printer is yesterday. The next best time is today. And uh, the longer I wait, it seems like the best time to buy a 3D printer is tomorrow <laughs> because they keep getting better, cheaper, and faster and just better all around. So that is awesome. Bamboo Labs, I think, is, I think is the way I'm going to go. Uh, I've seen nothing but good things uh, when it comes to Bamboo Labs. A lot of people on Discord talk about it. Gearlings talked about it. A lot of people... Uh, Jeff from Craft Computing, a lot of people I've talked to, they 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 like it. So, I don't know. Uh, soon, soon, soon. But that is awesome. It's not about me. I, 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 congratulations on ordering one. I don't know if it's your first, second, third, but uh, I hope it's awesome. I hope it's awesome. And it's funny because I hear, you know, uh, people who get it for the first time are super impressed or blown away. But even people who have had, you know, a 3D printer from a couple years ago are super impressed and blown away. Uh, so I think there's something there. I think Bamboo Labs is something going on, uh, not only for for people who have been doing it for a while, but I also think for for new time newbies like me. I, I will definitely be a newbie when it, when I when I buy one. Like uh, uh, it's going to take me forever to get it going. But I, I do have a short list of things I want to print. I do, I do for sure. Uh, TC, TFCPT, uh, I share that you're awesome. Thank you so much. Salute, salute from Portugal. Hey, salute or hello uh, from the US. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Texas feels like 98 or 98 feels like 110. Ooh, that means there's a lot of humidity. Dew points are high for sure. Uh, living in Southern California, swelter. Ooh, not good. Uh, 91 here with 50% humidity. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I, should, I shouldn't have talked about how nice it is outside today because <laughs> it is pretty nice uh undead hand hey how's it going good good to see you um hearing fahrenheit degree from europe is funny yeah for sure celsius rules yeah it's it, it's the opposite way too here when we hear you know when we hear celsius we're just like oh it's so cold and you, you have to do the math and you're like oh okay i i totally get it but one thing that i do know is that um i think celsius and fahrenheit meet at negative 40. And so there are times where the wind chill here is negative 40. And if I say that, then I'm right for both Fahrenheit and 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 you know, the Imperial way and, and, and the metric way. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, I know it's, it's weird. I still have to do the conversion in my head and I'm not going to lie. I always forget what it is and I have to Google it. So <laughs> uh, let's see, Slinky, I use, yeah, Celsius for PC temps, but atmospheric temps for Fahrenheit around here. Yeah, I found myself... Converting pretty often, friends around the world too. Yeah, Slinky Beast. I'm gonna say Beast or Biased Beast. I'm gonna go with Beast. Yeah, that it's funny because I hear that a lot too. Like I, I, I hear, I hear that from people you know who who use the metric system who still measure some things in the imperial way, like we do, um, and then some things in the metric way. And, and we do too, obviously. You know, obviously, like we we measure you know PC temps. We measure I don't know. We do a lot of metric stuff, too, because we're kind of forced to. Like, anytime you talk about any kind of international stuff or space, it's, you know, we, we it's it's not imperial way. It's the metric way. So, yeah, we have to do that conversion in our head all the time, too. It's not it's not just the rest of the world because we're one of the few that's using imperial. So we always have to do math. You know, oh, there's three feet in a meter. Like, you know, it's it, it never stops. <laughs> and it never stops, too, because, yeah, even even, you know, even for volume, too. Although we we do use liters, yeah. When we get into cubic like volume stuff, we it gets weird. Gallons, liters, we'll just use them both. It does not matter. <laughs> Weights too. So it, it, it's kind of wild. It's kind of wild. I, I I couldn't even believe. I I can't even imagine how much money it would cost us to switch. Like it would be an astronomical amount of money to switch. So I think everyone just kind of says we're gonna kick the can down the road and uh, not worry about it. Till we go to Mars, then then we'll then we'll when we occupy Mars, then we'll switch, <laughs> which which is another thing that like boggles my mind, right? Uh, and I'll get off it here in a second. Like we use we use metric, so so metric is based on Earth measurements, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, 
yeah, based on Earth measurements, uh, one meter, you know, I don't know how many meters are, but they divided up the Earth and they're like, oh, this is one meter. So we use Earth based measurements here, but we also use Earth based measurements in space. And then if we occupy Mars, will we use Earth based measurements in Mars too? Uh, since it's all based on Earth, and so a kilometer should be relative to the planet that you live on. And then when you start thinking of it that way, it's all made up anyways. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> Just like going back to feet. Anyways, I, I don't know. I, get, I always wonder, like, hmm, will they, when they go to Mars, will they say, like, oh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's one Earth kilometer. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, there is a measurement? I, uh, maybe, maybe there is. <laughs> oh, okay, well, the lights don't, yeah, I do apologize. I don't know. That, those are things I think about at night. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. Uh, nothing against Fahrenheit, but it's so confused on how to measure it. It seems that some drunk person invented it and thought, yeah, let's, let's use it. Yeah, it, it is. It is wild. It is wild. Um, it is. I, I agree. I, you know, it, I, I, someone made it up and then they started backing it up with ways to measure it. And they're like, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll keep doing that. <laughs> and then when metric came along, they were like, Hey, well, let's do this based on, you know, relative stuff in earth. Like, you know, when does water freeze and how big is the earth and divide that up, you know, which made a lot of sense until you go to another planet, then it's all made up too. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Uh, we'll use Mars bars. Yeah, I like it. I like it. We'll use Mars bars as a unit of measurement on Mars. I like it. I like it. Yeah, see, people on Mars, you know, in, a, in you know, whatever, 200 years when they're occupying there, they're like, why do we use kilometers? That seems so made up. That is not based on, you know, Mars. And, you know, I guess water would freeze at the same temperature. So that they, they might they might keep the temperature the same, but... <laughs> Yeah, kind of wild to kind of wild to think. Yeah, America uses anything but metric. I agree. I agree. Like, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, it's about five hands big, you know, whatever. It's th three steps away. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, one and a half bananas. <laughs> For sure. We will use anything but metric. You are exactly right. You know, it's about the size of, uh, I don't know, paperclip. <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. Love it. Love it. Um, okay. So defer Bay, uh, Tim finally able to catch a stream. I've uh, been hanging out in discord and talking through my home lab overhaul with wonderful folks there. I appreciate it. Thank you. I agree. There are wonderful people there. Just wondering, are you still using unraid in your lab? If so, uh, do you have, uh, yeah. Do you have any future follow-up video plans? Yes. Yes. I, so I still use it. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is one of the great things about Unraid. Uh, it's it's both, I think, a pro and a con is that it's installed on a USB drive. Uh, the, 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 the pro is that it's still plugged into one of my servers to where if I just reboot and uh, boot off that USB drive, I'm back in action. So yeah, so I was really kind of like evaluating on uh, uh, really when I when I was looking for that or testing it out, I was trying to figure out like my app server's OS, like wh what am I gonna run for my app server, you know? Uh, because I wanted I wanted a decent UI, I wanted things to be, you know, relatively performant and easy to configure. I've done neither of those. Uh, and I think that I think that Unraid uh, would have been a good fit for that. So yeah, I would like to do a follow-up video. I know that Unraid 7 is coming and I hear they addressed a lot of the things that I, uh, you know, feedback, I would say I had some pretty critical feedback of, of the current state, but they've been on six for a long time. I heard that seven addressed a ton of stuff. I just watched a video, uh, uh, I think by space invader one talking about the, the beta that's out for seven looks pretty awesome. So yeah, I, um, yeah, I, yeah. So will I use it in my home lab? I bought a license. It's on a USB drive. It's always going to be in my tool belt. Is it being applied? Right now, in this second, do I have one booted up? No. Uh, well, in the future, sure, sure, yeah. Why not? I'm not. I'm not against it. I wouldn't spend money on it if, uh, if I was like, ah, I'm never gonna try that. Uh, but yeah, I, I would love to do a follow up video. Um, I hear I, I've been talking to Space Invader One. Uh, we might do a podcast together soon. So if you know him, uh, I think he's an employee of Unraid. It's kind of hard to know, but he makes a ton of content for Unraid, and he does the Unraid podcast show. Uh, which I think has a different name. Anyways, uh, we we've been chatting, and uh, we might we might uh, chat it up on on his podcast. So, 
on YouTube. So anyways, uh, I'd love to, like, I am not, I, I love, I love operating systems. And even though there are times when, you know, I don't like things about an operating system, that does not mean I throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, if that were the case, I wouldn't even be using Mac right now. I wouldn't have a Windows machine. I wouldn't use Linux. You know, I wouldn't use TrueNAS. I wouldn't use Open Media Vault. Like all of this stuff. Uh, you know, if if one or two or a handful of features made me dislike something so much that I would never use it again, then I would I wouldn't have an operating system. I wouldn't have a phone. I wouldn't you know have a machine, a laptop, anything. So, so that being said, like you know, and and I want to be clear too that um, while sometimes users don't like to hear critical feedback about the things that they use, product owners and product managers and brands love to hear it if delivered professionally and in a way that's actionable. So, you know, even though I did have some critical things to say about uh, Unraid, you know, there are a lot of people who said, yeah, that, that's, that's true. Um, and, oh, we didn't think of it that way, or, oh, thank you so much. Like, you know, if, 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 if everyone's around you telling you that things are great and, you know, and you never get an outsider's perspective, especially when it comes to products, that's really hard to get feedback from, from, from customers that either aren't biased or just totally hate you in general. It's hard to get feedback from someone who's, who's knowledgeable in that field to actually give some feedback. So anyways, long story short, I feel like I'm uh, apologizing again. I already did that once. Uh, and even though a lot of people said I shouldn't, uh, I do feel bad sometimes when, when, when I, you know, give critical feedback. It's, it's just how I am. Like I, I, I'm instant apologize for anything. Uh, anyways, that being said, yes, it's uh, it's a tool in my tool belt. I I'd, I'd love to use it again. Cause I, I'm, I'm seeing a world now where I might have a couple mini app servers. So that one might be great for me. Is it going to be my NAS? Most likely not. Most likely not. Is it going to be a full-blown NAS for me? Most likely not. Is it a great NAS? Sure. Absolutely it is. Um, but will it be my NAS that I use? Probably not. I have a lot of my data in ZFS. I already have everything. I have fine-tuned, you know, uh, true NAS, like way beyond what anyone should need for home. And... Uh, <laughs> And after doing all that, it runs pretty good. So I don't know. And I get it that Unraid supports CFS and stuff like that too. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm for now, I'm going to just keep my, my data on TrueNAS. Will that change with Unraid 7, Unraid 8? Who knows? I love to move. I love to move stuff around. And I love to try new things. So if there's something better out there that makes my life easier, I am all for it. Like, I am not scared of change. I actually love change because it means something new. It means I get to learn something new. And even if I get to redo some stuff or, or, or it causes a lot of work or I got to work on something all weekend, I look forward to those things. So I, I'm super happy if a new NAS product comes along that is, you know, destroys everything I've seen before. I, I'd love to see that. <laughs> so anyways, I, I'll get off it. Um, and that's kind of how I am with a lot of stuff. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not tied to any one technology. As you, you can probably tell, I was talking about Mac earlier. I'm going to switch back to Windows for some stuff. I use Linux for some stuff. I, I, uh, I have a lot of tools in my tool belt, and uh, some projects require different tools, and I love to use them. So anyways, that, that's a great topic. Uh, I, hope, um, I, hope to, I hope to get on uh, the Unread podcast pretty soon. Pretty soon. We'll see. Uh, Techno Tim made some tests again uh, on Ju uh, Google Gemini. And regarding coding... It's working better than last time. Awesome. The trick is to be more specific in detail compared to ChatGPT, which is a bit annoying, but since I get a good answer, I assume it's acceptable. I'm a Google fan, but this Gemini being behind GPT, it's frustrating. So TFCPT. Yeah, um, I, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, so a couple things, you know, Gemini is, is, is uh, <laughs> it really is is Google's answer to ChatGPT, uh, somewhere that I honestly think that Google should have been at 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm gonna be hard on Google for a minute because they need people to be hard on them because they have been a sleeping giant for 10 to 15 years, maybe 20 years, just collecting ad revenue off of any everyone. Collecting your data, collecting ad re revenue, counting the money, right? And I get it, they've, they've done some innovation and stuff you know, but how far can you innovate email, right? 
AI can help. Um, they own YouTube, the biggest video content delivery service on the planet. But now they've run out of customers because everyone uses YouTube. And so now they're trying to scrape and claw back money from people by injecting ads directly into videos because people, you know, don't want to watch ads. I, I totally get it. But I think YouTube, Google, I mean, has had this opportunity in front of them for 10 years. They have data on everyone, everything ever written on the internet, everything that's digital possible. And they miss this opportunity. So it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be hard on Google. Uh, they are playing catch up with ChatGPT. I, I want them to be a player. I want them to be a player because if not, there's no competition, right? We need competition. And uh, I love what Google does. I, I use GCP. I use a ton of the products. I'm a huge fan. But they need they need to get caught up. And they need to win back the minds of people if, if they want to play in this AI game. A lot of people have already decided ChatGPT is the answer. Like, you know, ChatGPT now is like, it's like, it's like Adobe, dare I say, where, you know, it's, 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 it's synonymous now with AI and chatbots, you know? And so, so Google has a lot of catching up to do, uh, not only, uh, technically, right. To, to, to get better services, to get better AI, more data, <laughs> they have enough data, but to train and get better models, but they also have catching up to do in marketing and Mindshare, uh, which which is kind of sad, which is kind of sad because they've had this opportunity sitting in front of them for a long time. And, uh, you know, although ChatGPT seemed to come out of nowhere, it's been around. Like OpenAI's been around for a while and they've been talking about what they're doing. So anyways, I, I uh, so <laughs> I'll stop beating up on Google because I, I really appreciate Google. And this is all feedback they've probably heard from analysts for months, right? And so I think they have a unique opportunity, uh, more unique than anyone else, except for maybe Microsoft. So no, theirs is even more unique. Why is there more unique than anyone else? They own Google, Google search, they own Android devices, they own GCP, they own the cloud, you know, they own their own cloud and that they know how to do AI. So they have a, you know, a vertical of AI, you know, that they can deliver to people. Who else has that vertical? Eh, I mean, Microsoft kind of does, right? Now, now, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, you know, they're they're releasing their AI PCs, Copilot PCs, but they're manufactured by someone else. Uh, whereas with Google, with Pixel, they don't, you know, they are the manufacturers. And iPhone, you know, uh, they have to lean into ChatGPT because <laughs> they got nothing going on in the back. I mean, there's a lot going on, but they're just outright going to use, you know, ChatGPT or OpenAI. So I think Google is uniquely positioned to make this great. I just, I hope they do. I hope they do. And I hope that like, you know, right now I, 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 know, a, I know a couple of diehard Google people who are fans of Google, who will use anything Google before anything else. And they're one of the few people I hear talking about Gemini. And I don't want it to be that way. I, wa I, want, it, I want it to be more popular. Like I hear chat GPT probably 50 times a day you know, throughout the internet, throughout the people, people I'm with, I hear Gemini maybe once or twice. And that I think, I think Google is going to pay a lot of money to educate people to market it, uh, but they need to. So anyways, I'll, I'll get off that. Uh, anyways, what you're saying is, Hey, I need to, I need to be, uh, what you're saying is I need to be more specific when I talk to Gemini. And then when I talk to Gemini, I get better answers. Whereas with chat GPT, I could be more vague, but I get really good answers. And, uh, I'll have to do the side side by side comparison too. I will. I and you know I I should also say I I think I said this in the last time we sh uh, were talking in the stream about you know ChatGPT and and Gemini. I th also think that Gemini is also uniquely positioned, as is Microsoft, to deliver AI on existing touch points. You know outside of hardware. I mean Google Workspaces, Google Docs, YouTube. You know you name it. Google search, which yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I want to turn that off on Google search. Cause when I see Gemini start typing, it, it's just wasting my time. Cause it's, 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 you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's totally distracting as I wait for an answer, which I know is not going to be right anyways, but they are uniquely positions. Cause they have so many, you know, modals or touch points where Microsoft kind of does too, right? Microsoft kind of does too. I mean, arguably office 365. So they have something very similar. So it, I don't know. I, it's, um, 
I, I think we're very early on, and I don't mean to be so hard on Google, but man, I want them to catch up. I want them to win. I mean, I, I want, I want, I want competition. Right now, it doesn't seem like there's a lot, uh, except for like diehard fans, and I, I want that to change. I want, I want there to be choice for sure. Oh, I'll, I'll stop talking about AI stuff because, uh, man, I, I've probably been going out too much. Uh, Yakto, yes, we heard that 400 amp service. Yes, 200 PC Geek. I finally have 200 amp panel at home and my 30 amp 120 volt outlet to my APC uh, 2200 VA. I get one hour, 1.25 hours of runtime on that UPS, <laughs> all with my two to three servers running on it. That is great. That is great. That is great. So having I mean, having 30, 40 minutes is pretty good, but you're getting over an hour. That is pretty awesome. So, so, so if, if, if the power goes out in your neighborhood, basically outside of small blips and, and anything else like you're, 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 I mean, I mean, you're covered beyond small blips. So if the power is going to be out for an hour, it's probably going to be out for longer than an hour. So you're covered in all scenarios, except for Hey, the power is going to be out for half a day, which which is totally fine because, you know, no one's going to have, you know, UPS. It's going to last that long. So it's pretty awesome to be able to basically survive everything outside of the power company taking, you know, a, a, a business day to repair something. Because, you know, it doesn't go from like uh, one hour. I don't know what at least from what I've seen, it's either going to be a blip. It's going to be 10 or 15 minutes, you know. Or it's going to be a couple hours, <laughs> you know, outside. So you got the blip and the 10 or 15 minutes covered uh, outside the hour. It's usually going to be a couple hours. So then it's like, oh, great. You know, nothing could prepare for that. So that, that is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, Crypto Spartan. Yeah, I think people used to do raised tiles uh, when you could pull them up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm dating myself. But yeah, the data center that I worked in back in the day, it was raised tiles. They had a little finger hole every so often where you could finger hole, pull it up, and then you could pull up all the other ones. And all the cords were down there and all the power was down there. But I think now everyone puts it up top, which I think is the right way. Uh, yeah, I see trays overhead. Yeah, I agree. I agree for sure. For sure. Uh, got last weekend off. Janice Q says uh, in Finland, we got a midsummer holiday. That is awesome. Midsummer holiday. We don't get those. I mean, we 4th of July is about uh, the only thing we get during true summer. And then the end of summer <laughs> uh, for Labor Day. So that is pretty awesome. Yeah, there, there aren't a lot, of, a lot of holidays, you know, from July until the end of summer. So we need, we need more. We need more. Uh, Cubes. Cubes OS instead of Proxmox in order to be able to use uh, the machine as a daily driver at home. Remote desktop to it and from an old MacBook Pro on the go. Yes or no? Greetings from Portugal. Huh. I don't know Cubes OS. So I so I've seen this name before. I don't know what it is. I've seen the name before. I can't remember. But really what you're saying is, hey, I, I want to run a hypervisor and then in there I want to run virtual machines and then I want to be able to remote desktop to them, you know, use terminals basically to get in this machine as your daily driver. Yes or no? Um, it depends. I, I think it depends. Like if you if you if you co-locate a lot of your services in there, right? And you, you know, have a decent amount of RAM, has decent SSD, you know, solid state drives, uh, and you could maybe pass a video card if you need that. Uh, because, you know, it's not only for video games, it's just for video acceleration overall, right? So YouTube videos don't run like crap <laughs> and anything else like that. Um... I think it could work. Uh, I think it could work. I, I, I would say if you are going to do this remote desktop, while well, well, it's great, it, it, it's great for like vector type stuff, spreadsheets, email, web pages that aren't scrolling, <laughs> kind of static images. It's great. Super high performing, great codec. It even works pretty good, you know, across the board if you're, I don't know, if you have remote effects turned on, but that requires not Proxmox and all this other stuff. Uh, so it works pretty good, I would say. Though, once you start getting into like kind of 3D rendering and stuff like that, like, you know, very minimal stuff, I, I'm not even talking about games or anything that's video accelerated, it kind of kind of struggles, right? Because it's painting the screen over and over and over. And while it does great for some things, it doesn't do great for others. Um, you know, and that's where, you know, something like Parsec might be a better fit. So um, on both cases, you're going to have to do the whole like double encode thing. I don't know. Uh, so it really depends on the video card you have going on there. That being said, like if you have a whole bunch of like laptops, like you're saying, hey, I got a, got a MacBook on the go, an old MacBook, and 
it'll connect just fine. Sure, I say I say try it. I say try it because it uh, it's not, it's an interesting it's an interesting challenge. I'll say that uh, I went back and forth on this. You know, I would love to have just dumb terminals everywhere and have them all have like the best experience ever because they're connected to my servers. Uh, and uh, you know, I've done that. I, I I've even like created my Windows development uh, desktop environment on a VM to do exactly that. So it's like, oh, I can connect all my tools are installed. Anytime I need to compile or do anything for Windows-based stuff, .NET stuff, there it is, you know, and uh, it works out great for that. So, but yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I say go for it. I say go for it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to just, I, I did go over a little bit. I'm going to look for ones that are specifically mentioning me. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, oh, I clicked on this one, so I'm going to read it. But after this, I'm going to look for ones that are specifically mentioning me. Vite it. Vite. Um, I will be offering Proxmox backup server for friends and family and others. They pay for gigabytes of storage they use and then just mount my PBS over the internet. <laughs> I have a redundant 40 gigabit ethernet connection and will upgrade to a redundant 100 gigabit. Oh, 100 gig. Wow. Wow. So, so you will not be the bottleneck. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. So, so what you're saying is, Hey, I have a ton of, I have a ton of bandwidth. I have a ton of server space. And I have this thing called Proxmox Backup Server. I'm just going to offer it to my friends and they'll pay per gig. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Great way to pool resources. And you're going to do it over the internet. <laughs> um, I mean, that's fine. I would, uh, yes. So is it safe? Probably because it's encrypted over the wire. Um, you might want to look into maybe building some VPN tunnels or you know, something like tail scale to just allow people on your network and, you know, still do it over like a mesh network so they can, you know, only get to that device or, you know, so you don't have to do it over the internet or you don't have to open ports is probably a, a better thing, but you'll figure this all out. Like if, if, if you're, <laughs> if, if, if you got 40 gigabit ethernet now and you're going to hundred gig and you're running Proxmox and you already have like PBS set up and you're backing all this stuff up, I'm not telling you something you haven't already thought of. So it sounds fun. It sounds fun. I love, I love building services that people use. And that sounds, that sounds great. Like, Hey, you know, people are running Proxmox. Uh, they want to be able to back their stuff up off site and you're providing a service that like, for me, that, that, that like fills like some, want that I, that, that, that I always want to have. Like, I always have this desire to like provide a service for people that they'll use. And, uh, by doing that, I get a lot of enjoyment. So that sounds fun. It sounds like a great, great, uh, great challenge, uh, to solve for sure. Okay. Going to look for, uh, going to look for mentions specifically, uh, I moved by, oh, this says, Tim, you're the man. You just saved me from getting caught up in CICD rabbit hole. Thank you so much. Hey, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, Cheeto, Cheeto Bandito. I remember this one. Hey, how's it going? Uh, a thought on Nix. Uh, I, you know, I need to, I need to know more about Nix. My extent of knowing Nix is, hey, Nix is a great package manager. And then, oh, by the way, we're going to build, you know, Linux around a great package manager. That's the extent of what I know next. I should run it at home, so I know it a little bit better. So I, I, have, I have no comment. I, I think it's awesome. Like, I think it's awesome. Like anything, anything challenging the status quo, right? The status quo is like, hey, you know, we have package managers and they're pinned to some old version per distribution. The only way to get new ones is to like circumvent all that stuff, install a different package manager or upgrade, you know? And so the idea of like, being able to, you know, I guess kind of like Arch, like kind of get the latest, but in Nix, it's in a more repeatable way or get the version you want in a more repeatable way. I think that's cool. So I think like, yeah, anything challenging the status quo, anything that's new, I, I'm all for it. Like, I like it. Like if it's solving a problem for, you know, for people or a challenge that people have, and it's a legitimate challenge. Yeah, I'm all for it. Because even, even if Nix itself doesn't survive, I'm not saying it won't, but things like this that challenge the status quo, it challenges other people in that area or in that space to do better, to borrow some of the ideas, to enhance their own product, to include some things like this. So, so even if, even if, you know, the, 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 this specifically isn't the end all be all, 
I hope it's made enough of an impact to make, you know, other distributions, uh, uh, you know, not bad an eye and uh, get some ideas. Anyways, I need, to, I need to know more about it. I should try it. I should totally spin it up because I'm so uneducated on it other than what I just said, but it sounds fun. It sounds fun for sure. I'd love to spin it up. I probably should. I probably should. Everyone, everyone that has done it is like telling me to join them, join the dark side. I, but I don't know if it's the dark or the light side, <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Um, has anyone bought a minis forum MSO one for home lab? If so, is it good? And what are you running? TD five one Oh five. I have not like, I'm super interested in it. Um, I feel like it's been out for a while now to where, Hey, when's the MSO2? Uh, but it looks awesome. Like there, there are a lot of great features. I would suggest like um, if, uh, if if you're interested in it, there's there's obviously a lot of YouTubers who have done stuff on it. Jeff from Craft Computing, uh, Cody from, uh, not Cody, <laughs> Colton from uh, Hardware Haven uh, has done videos on it. And then uh, Jim from Jim's Garage has even applied that and created, you know, Proxmox servers in a HA cluster using them. So there's a lot of, there's no shortage of contents, uh, of stuff out there. What I was going to do is very similar to what, uh, Jim from Jim's garage is doing is create a HA cluster, HA Proxmox cluster that also has Ceph. And then what he did, which I think is great. And what I would have done too, is use the Thunderbolt for 25 gig networking in a token ring. But all of this, basically a token ring, uh, but all of this, like, you know, all of this stuff he did, I think kind of assumes that you're gonna, ha gonna have three. Uh, anyways, that's what I wanted to do. I think they're great little machines. Um, you know, three MVMEs, uh, decent, I think it's a 13th gen processor in there. You can buy older ones, a decent amount of RAM. You know, uh, I think enough lanes to do what you wanna do. It's still a desktop processor. So I think it's good, I think it's good. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's close to perfect. You know, it's a small workstation. I've heard, you know, heard stuff about fans and it getting hot, uh, unnecessarily small, but if you want to, if you want a great, uh, review of what it is, uh, go watch hardware Haven and, uh, craft computing's video on it. But there are lots of, lots of things you could do, but for me, it would be Proxmox all the way. Cause you know, I, or, or my app server, what I just built, you know, that would be great on it. Cause it has NVMe drives fast has, uh, uh, wouldn't have my video card though. This is where I'm saying like Intel, get some more AI slash ML stuff on chip. So then I don't have to use an NVIDIA video card to do some of this stuff. Cause you already have good compute. You have good single core performance. Now you have E cores and P cores. You have quick sync. Just give me some AI stuff. Sorry, you're not seeing my hand. Give me some AI stuff. And then I won't need PCI Express to put an NVIDIA video card in. I'm sure they know this stuff. They know, I'm not telling them anything they don't know. Yeah, when is the MSO2? That's that's where I'm at too. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of there, kind of there. Uh, I, 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 might, I have no idea. It's probably not coming anytime soon, you know? But after I think, oh, the product's been out for a little over a year, I think-ish, I'm kind of like, oh, may, maybe something is on the horizon, but they're pretty tight-lipped. I think uh, Minis Forum is doing a ton of like innovative stuff for small space, for laptops, for home lab workstations. They're, they're just kind of like all over the place making these super niche kind of products that have a great fit where they're, you know, they have great market fit, right? Like, hey, home lab slash workstation, let's give you two 10 gigabit ethernet, you know, jacks, <laughs> you know, and oh, by the way, we're gonna throw two dual 2.5 on there just in case too. It's like, no, no one does that. No one does that. You either choose one or the other, but they did both dual. So it's pretty awesome what they're doing. Uh, I think they're, I feel like they're, I feel like they're like, you know, a mechanical engineer or a builder themselves and they're building stuff that they want to see, you know, and they're trying to push stuff to the limits, which I, I think is super awesome. Anyways, I've talked way too long. I went a little bit longer. Sorry, piece of geek. You're probably like, dude, wrap it up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, all of you probably are because I went a little bit longer. But no, thank you guys all so much for being here. If you wanna, if you wanna continue this conversation or skipped over your uh, message, I apologize. I tried to get to everyone I can. There was a ton, and then when you know time runs out, I kind of got to look for ones that are specifically looking for me. If I skipped over your message or you want to say something that I didn't say uh, that uh, you didn't say in here. You absolutely can. You can join our Discord server. We're really close. We have close to 10,000 uh, members there. It keeps going up and getting close and then down, up and then close and then down. I think it's, I don't know if it's bots or what's going on. 
We're super close to 10,000 uh, members. Uh, hey, maybe you could join. You could be the 10,000th person. Uh, super chill, super laid back. Lots of tech topics on almost everything we talked about today and more. Uh, a lot of information in there too. Uh, so if you're looking for something and trying to fix something, uh, if you search through there, you're going to find an answer, especially on a lot of the things that we talked about uh, here throughout. Um, there were uh, subs, resubs. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There were, there were definitely follows too. Thank you for following. I appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't followed yet, hey, just click the follow button. Uh, if you want to know when I go uh, when I go live, uh, you can either sign up for notifications here or sign up for notifications in Discord. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Cy okay, Cyber Spartan. Uh, how do you, this is the last question. How do you handle password for Docker services? I hate the idea of putting a password in plain text in the config file in the container. Two ways. Two ways you could do it. Use a .env file. Uh, is that the best way? Not the best way. It's better than putting it in YAML. Why is that not the best way? Well, if you do a stack, then everything in the stack arguably could read that environment variable, right? Because environment variables are per stack. Um, wait a second. Are they? No. If, wait, what am I saying? I don't think they're per stack. I don't know. Anyways, .envs, uh, they're great, usually for config, uh, but they can be used for passwords in a production environment. You really wouldn't use a .env. You'd use Docker Secrets, where you load the Docker secret off the file that can only be read by that service, and it can't be read as an env variable from anywhere else. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're right. They usually are, but they can be scoped. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I was like going down this path, and I'm like, wait a second. I just did this the other day, and it's scoped to. Yeah, that's right. So you can you can scope them to each individual service within the stack, or you can scope them to the whole stack. When I, what does what Tim use at home? What was I doing earlier today? I have an EMV variable per service that is in a stack. So each EMV variable or each service, they'll say from EMV and then it's in its own. Now I'm like confusing myself. No, yeah, so, so, so the file would be at the stack level. Anyways. <laughs> Now I'm confusing myself. What I do is I use EMV. I know it's not the most secure thing in the world. A lot of times my stacks are only one service or two service that kind of need it anyways. If you're if you're running a stack that has 30 services long, .env is not for you. Uh, .env should be used for config, generally speaking, config, right? Not secrets. And then you use the secrets file for the rest. A lot of people in home lab still use .env. That's the risk, right? Is that any other stack in that service could read that variable if it's loaded for the whole stack. So anyways, I uh, personally, I, I, I kind of I kind of beefed. I don't know. I don't have a beef with them. I just find secrets for Docker a little bit less, I don't know, useful in a home lab scenario because a lot of the variables have to be able to read from that file and translate the text on that file to the secret. So uh, it's kind of weird. So if you're using containers, like sometimes existing containers don't have a way to read that from the file and it gets super weird, super weird. So anyways, um, that's what you're looking for. In YAML is absolutely not what you should do. .env is better than that. And even better than that is Docker secret. So, and I, I think I have it. Uh, oh yeah. In my latest traffic video, traffic three, you'll see where I have this blurb about <laughs> Docker secrets in general, but I do talk about the differences and I do implement them both ways in that video. So if you want to, Hey, you know, three minute primer on how to do it, you can right there in that video. So anyways, don't put them in YAML, .env, and even better than that is Docker secrets. Anyways, I'm, I'm going to take off. Hey guys, have a happy, happy Saturday. Have a great rest of the weekend. I'll be back here on Twitch on next Saturday. I should have something out for you here this week. I hope I can get it written, filmed and, and, and out to you. Um, thank you again for the follows. Thank you again for the subs, resubs. Appreciate it. I'll be in Discord if you need me. Have a great weekend and be good to each other. Take care, folks.